Welcome back to Why in the Morning. It's Wednesday and it's one of my favorite day in the week because I get to laugh in the morning, have interesting discussions and interviews. And as usual, on Strength of a Woman, we have a phenomenal woman. But before we get to our interview, we have a question from me, for you. So this question goes like this. I say, Nini Nini Watu Angalia Wakitafta, Life Partners. Remember, it's Y254 at 4. We are celebrating our birthday. And birthday comes, birthdays come with uh, gifts and joy so we have so many gifts for you but for you to get our gifts you have to go on our social media platforms and comment life partner and the winner at up our gifts yes and don't forget to follow us on our social media platforms at y254 channel so right about now we have a phenomenal woman in the house grace kinethia karibu sana thank you i'll let you introduce yourself tell us what you do my name is Chris Kenothia. Yes. As you said, I'm a psychologist by profession. Yes. When I'm a mental health advocate. Yeah. Uh, Basically, that's what I do. That's what you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, psychologist and life coach. It's see the same thing. It's crazy to me the same. Uh, I've been trained on life coaching, and I'm also currently doing my NLP. It's a neuro linguistic program uh -huh. programming thing. Okay. Yeah. So. It's not the same. I would say they are related, but not per se, because I think life coaching or coaching is more, it's specific. Mm. And you're trained how to deal with people or how to give people solutions, how to help them journey map their lives, be it business or companies or etc. Yeah. Okay, so so we'll, it's more detailed. Okay. We'll get to that because okay. I want to know like the difference. But before even we get to what is life coaching and psychology, maybe you can tell us where this journey started, uh, what inspired you to be who you are right now okay I've been trying to think about this like <laughs> how do you miss that anyway basically being a psychologist I'd say can I say it was my mistake or I found myself there okay. I've, I have a background in criminology something I never get to mention a lot and when I went back to school I studied here at you and when I went back to school I was confused I didn't know what to do so I asked my lecturer well, what can I study and they were like uh, I think a combination with whatever you've done in psychology can fit in then along the way I got to love it though earlier before then I used to be a peer counselor then I used to go to high school this is when you go to high school for mentorship it I see I think it was in the system before mm -hmm. then yeah. yeah so in psychology my psychology friends tell me that uh, it's wide and it can be divided into smaller smaller groups yeah. so you clinical psychology screening in counseling, family, counseling yeah. Yeah. so where are you placed some of us as we've said because I've done okay I went ahead and did other certifications like trauma but when I went to I just did the whole psychology I majored in psychology in psychology yeah. so you can I just did the whole thing so you can uh, you can advise people from different groups you're yeah. not like a family counselor or a clinical counselor okay the topics i wouldn't say i would pick mm -hmm. but when you study you study everything actually then there are people who decide i want to major in child psychology but you basically have knowledge on everything i don't think even any psychology is, is insufficient for any topic but most of the time you get to decide what's your passion okay yeah so what uh, what makes you really happy about working with people i mean, i'd say i wouldn't say it's an easy job let me put in quotes I think the, the beauty about working with people is listening to different stories it's not a boring job you see it's not a program whereby you're going to wake up tomorrow in the morning and oh, I'm going to listen or oh, I'm going to do calculations or oh, I'm going to suppose each day it's a new client it's a new story it's a, you know it's a new problem some are a bit difficult you have to go talk to your friends or maybe go back and just decide what do you give solutions go back to books learn more and this the only I think it's one of the only fields in medicine that you have to keep on reading 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 because it's a new way whatever you were taught in school most likely I can't even apply half of that the new ways of doing things the new issues maybe when you learn social media was not part of an addiction it's an addiction you have to learn how do you treat it how do you manage this yeah talking about social media as an addiction maybe you can explain to us how you deal with it okay how are we doing with it mostly we treat it like any other addiction it's a behavior addiction how do you get to now train the brain train the mind how not to you know what's first of all you look what are the triggers how did you end up as as a social media addict was it because you were curious because you were spending more time on that how do you, what are the harming behaviors when it becomes an addiction mm -hmm. how does it get to affect your life you know more you know an addiction is something that gets to you know impact your life like you can't function normally if we take away your phone you're going to get sick so how do we get to undo that and what uh, what is the healing process like so maybe if I'm addicted to my phone mm -hmm. what's the healing process like first we'd have to find out why you're addicted to your phone okay. is it because you don't have a social 
in life in the physical state that your only friends are online is it because you're masking or that's how, where you feel safe then because this is just the byproduct whatever you see in the physical part but what's the real situation so once we get to learn about that why you you know is it because you don't feel connected to people around you how do you build a connection to people around you is it because when you stress that's your coping mechanism is it because maybe that's where you work how do we find other alternatives now that's where life coaching comes in how do we find other alternatives for you to be able to work in other ways that are not harmful in the end mm -hmm. yeah so maybe you can uh, help me separate the difference between psychology life coaching and life coaching okay psychology basically i think psychology is a whole as you say you go to class and learn for years you learn a lot of things you learn how the mind works how the mind works you learn organization psychology child psychology and you learn from development you learn a lot of history psychology has a lot of history but for life coaching it's more of learning how do you it's more of journey mapping how do you get to structure people's life in a way they want and you work with a person you don't even get to diagnose when it comes to life coaching you work what's your goal what do you want to achieve how do we get there you st at this situation how do we get where you are and that's what would make you happy what you know what do you see and there's no right or wrong answer when it comes to life coaching it's about you what makes you happy what do you want but i think for psychology i'll be there saying could this be harmful do you feel harmful you know for life coaching it's more finding the best version of you oh and psychology is more of healing something exactly finding solutions healing. Solutions. they are interlinked in a way but uh -huh. it will take i can go to school and do a certification and become a life coach but by the time you become like a psychologist it takes a lot of a when you look at the study system but there are also certifications in life coach that take also a lot of time and it's something you keep on learning learn it's not a one-day thing here mm -hmm. so you said that life coaching is more of uh, helping someone discover their journey what if i don't know what i want that's where you start with your personality what do you okay. want to learn though it involves both psychology because you see also since personality is in psychology you have to learn what do you like what are your goals it's a growing process actually none is instant both of them is something you just sit down discover slow and get to learn here mm. yeah and between the two which one do you enjoy most both of course they're inter <laughs> they're intertwined. yeah because again at times you find people thinking i'm having a mental health issues i think no but then again i'm like this is not even that this is more of life coaching you see because also there are issues you have to learn what do you use do you, are you do you, are you depressed or maybe are you lacking financial skills because you find that some of these issues again people might think do you have anxiety or is it because you can't manage a certain skill when it comes to people mm. are you having issues with public speaking or are you anxious you know mm -hmm. well which both of them can be interrelated mm -hmm. yeah and you as a person as a psychologist and a life coach do you ever find yourself in that position where you need the help and you're we not the help yeah we all have to most people ask me i think even a week ago i was working with someone on a project and um, i've forgotten something and they're like who do you go for for help when you need help and i'm just like we do at times we do to peer to peer like a fellow psychologist you can go talk to, it's called debriefing whereby you talk to somebody at times you need your own therapy because most of the times you get to be the offloading point people give you a lot if you're not careful that can end up in your system or you know you're only human as well so if you need also to go talk to somebody we also have our own personal lives you have your family you have your issues you have ATC so how do you get to now handle that because by the time I'm coming to listen to your issues I have to make sure I'm okay so if I'm having my own things I need to work on I need as well need somebody we all have a way to go about so it so you take a break from work and deal with your issues or how do you separate your work and your personal life I think when you've done it for for a while you already know even when you're speaking to a client and something triggers you but you already know when to call your therapist hey you you know mm -hmm. like can i see or oh, can we talk about this i think i am this triggered me or this what happened unless it's very i wouldn't say i've gotten to i take breaks but i wouldn't really say it's that much of I really need to do this like if I don't do this I can see a client or something but people yeah it's helpful okay so yeah. you're also a mental health uh, advocate yes. and a psychologist a life coach maybe you can share with us some of the mental health issues that you have dealt with or that are rampant in this time 
Okay, I think Kenya we have a thing for depression. <laughs> so okay. maybe, yeah, because it feel like if you stressed everybody, everything. If you in bad mood swings, if you're not talking to people, people say maybe they're depressed. If you're uncared people, I think most of the time that's one that I've seen. And we have a thing for self diagnosis as people. So I think that will be one of the things. But the other issues, basic issues like trauma. Trauma is a huge thing, especially childhood trauma. You find that most people in our society have things. The people who are 30 years old who are angry at something that happened at five years there's somebody who's 60 who's angry at the sister or brother that something they did at 15 or 18 I, that's something also common we also have some family issues parental issues that are also common where people you find that they see sibling rivalry i think that's in every african society i'm starting to think yes. so in every society we have another one is esteem issues especially even in men yeah i have to like put that in capital letters which is also there i think it's basically life skills that we didn't get mm. then now translates to suicidal thoughts mental health anxiety etc and you said that even in men there's like self-esteem oh, yeah and there's this common misconception or say that men really don't need to open up mm -hmm. how true is that or what's your comment about that I think for the past since 2017 till now I've been doing an event called Masculinity Monday and most it's more about men how do men deal with their issues how do men live with their life it is and you find that men are human so I think they have more issues than us women and even when I was coming here and they're like oh go talk about women now <laughs> and I'm thinking yeah guys have a lot of issues and most of the time it's just that I think the way we were brought up or socialized as women we are not supposed to you know when you're with a man there I think he's supposed to listen to you more than you're supposed to listen to him mm -hmm. most of the time is about him like how was your day and it's about you venting other than the other way around you asking him how was your day or even your brother or your father you asking them how was your day and they get to say had a bad day and asking you know we don't go the extra step to ask why what happened how are you feeling about this and how do you as a psychologist help break that uh, cycle of you know men always having to appear strong but they're hurting on the inside okay for men what they need for many takes time most of the time but it's all again okay for people to speak out but something i've also learned when you're in a circle of men and one opens up and another one can relate you find that oh me too this the, this thing is normal i think for men they just need one person to speak among the circle if you're friends with like five guys and you have an issue if you be the person who speaks out then the others feel comfortable to talking and you guys can sit down and talk they just need to feel like i'm not the only one or to feel that i want to be point i'm weak or something of the sort but lately i see a lot of men opening up okay that's yeah. really nice so you say that Ken has a thing for depression so maybe you can help us understand what depression really is <laughs> then okay most of the thing what i say depression you have to be diagnosed okay. it's not something you sit down and wake up and say uh -huh, i think i'm depressed you can see the signs and symptoms but it really take a professional to sit down and it's not a one-time thing you don't come to me as a professional and i'm just like you have depression and i can refer you to a psychiatrist then go for your evaluation it's something that happens it's a cycle you have to have assessment they have to track down your behavior journal down your behavior it's something that happens over time yeah and uh, what's the difference between being depressed and being anxious okay anxiety is more of Okay, most of the time anxiety comes with physical symptoms, like once you can say, for example, panic attacks, whereby you find somebody can't breathe, it's more of the physical thing, then it, the triggers are more visible. As for depression, some people can be subconsciously depressed. Mm -hmm. But for anxiety, if somebody's anxious, you're just going to see they're shaking, you know, the way they talk, the way they are, they're sweating, some of them sweat, some can't even move or some. It's more, for anxiety, it's more, you can pinpoint it. And stress? And for stress, it's for stress then some people are good at masking because then again we were taught stress is normal which of which is normal then there's good stress and bad stress i think and then most of the time i think we focus on the bad side of it there's good stress whereby you get motivated to do something like you feel like if i don't achieve this or if i don't do this i'm going to achieve you know that's a motivation and then there's bad stress whereby it's the negative energy that comes with it now for stress now this unless you get to know what's making you uncomfortable when are you moving out of your routine when 
when was the last time you were happy like genuinely feeling happy how difficult is it for you maybe at work how is it impacting your life and those close to you mm -hmm. then from there that's when it piles up to something like depression when you now can't control it you have to see a professional or something yeah mm -hmm. so when a client walks into your office what is the first thing that you do history taken okay history taken. yeah like you need to know who are they why did they come here is there a history of mental health in the family are they the far why do they feel they need to see a counselor you need to know what you're dealing with before you even get there yeah and let's say uh yes after the history taking you start the healing process <laughs> then uh after you feel like the client is now okay do you do follow-up or are they just go their own way? you know something Mental health is supposed to be like a like a medical checkup, okay. whereby you don't have to be sick or you don't even have to have issues to go for therapy. therapy. No, okay. you can just go sit there and talk to somebody about anything. And the beauty about it, when you sit down and talk, it's when you get to maybe figure out an idea. The beauty, I tell people the bit about therapy. I'm not there to judge you. I'm there to listen to you. I don't have even an opinion about you know the person you can just go sit down scream do whatever you want and they're just going to know are you okay you're comfortable you're good as long as you're good that's okay so do you make decisions for people am I you help them figure out what is right do we help you figure out unless it's now a condition whereby most maybe you need to be in a hospital or it's above your control because you find there are situations like that says schizophrenia bipolar at some extent whereby if you're suicidal to and we feel like you're a danger to yourself or somebody else, that's the point. You and your close ones can sit down and we we'll decide this is the best way to go for you. Oh. Yeah. So you have a program called Jitunze, yeah. wellness program. Maybe you can share what it is about. Jitunze, as the Swahili name says, take care of yourself. I think for mental health, when you look around, if people would take care of themselves, that's the whole concept. Because you find that, again, there's a lot of, we have, as Africans, we have a blame, blame culture whereby you feel, why are you sad? It's because one, two, three did this to me. Why are you depressed? Or oh, how did you end up this? It's because my parents and whoever and whoever they knew. Why are you like this? Because I was neglected as a child. There's always something about somebody else. Why are you always angry at work? It's because my boss did one, two, three. It's never about I did this or I didn't do this. So for this, it's about from the basics. How do you take care of yourself? How do you get to learn about yourself? It's more of a course program whereby you get to start from the basics. Identities self-awareness social awareness how do you get to unpack that then from there you're able to know what are the best ways to take care of yourself how do you how do you get to support the, those who are around you are you prone to mental health issues uh, do you have financial issues how do you get to take care of that here mm -hmm. so how do you guys function uh, do you like go to communities and talk to them um, you have an office set up where people come and learn this is more of a request program so whereby it's the same thing as life coaching or something so other than doing so in the years of doing this i've learned some of these issues they're not even issues that are supposed to be end in people suicidal or depressed what if you came up with something that people would sit down and even you as you, you and your girlfriends do you have a topic you want to learn about can you maybe figure out esteem is a common issue a common issue among the stars what do you get to learn about that can you sit down it's more of a request program whereby you and your friends or your peers come around i do schools whereby we can go to school but it's no more of the motivation talk it's more of the learning process because for school is a four-year program when you take it maybe in high school and in form one you get done with it at form four so it's something continuous how do you get to learn about yourself how do you get to learn about your personality because these are not things we were taught in our system yes, yes. so now when you are all grown-ups that's when you're trying to figure out what do I like am I a sanguine do I like people am I introvert is it so there's more of sitting down and getting to you know paying attention to yourself because I think we were taught like Paying attention to herself is selfish. Now, how do you get to unlearn that? Yeah. Mm. And do you have like a, a group that you guys focus on, or you do all ages from children to youth to the old people? What I've done, I've partnered with different people because I'm not able in a position to like handle everybody. Mm -hmm. So what happens? We have different psychologists in my database. So if somebody needs this and I'm not in a position to handle it, or I'm doing something else, I know I know who's best dealing with issues of men and who's best in child psychology 
okay. and was best in life coaching are just to refer then we have like more of a curriculum or a guideline that you're supposed to follow and they fly with it mm. just and go ahead how long have you guys operated mm. The Jutunza Wellness Program? Uh, this gonna be. Jutunza was rich. Actually, I was thinking about this before I came. <laughs> like yesterday when I was coming, I realized that we got officially in 2018. That's when now, if you go to the books and the papers, that's when Jutunza now started. But this has been happening since 2017, so it's about four years or so. Mm. Yeah. And what are, what are the things that motivate you like, to go on, to go on, and to push on? I think as an individual is waking up each morning and somebody's like, thank you. I think this worked for me. That for me, that's it. Like seeing somebody saying, oh, my child is now better. Or oh, can we, or somebody saying, oh, I liked what you did with one, two, three. Can I come? You know, can, how can we get to do this? Yeah. You see that feedback whereby you're like, this is the weirdest career ever. You help people so that they can move away from you. Like <laughs> You give them solutions so that they can't become your clients anymore. But just waking up and somebody is saying, oh, you did a good job. You see that small message in WhatsApp or something, somebody said, oh, you, I know you said this in the group, or you were talking about this in the group, but one week later somebody said, I actually practiced this, and it's, you know, helped me. Right. I, I think that's, that's all at a time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but now we're moving beyond in Africa, and we are starting now our small communities elsewhere. Okay, that's yeah. really nice. And some of the challenges that maybe you've experienced in your yeah. yeah, challenges is that the people who really need this can't afford it. Okay. So you find that, especially during COVID, are you going to pay your bills? Are you going to buy your food? Or are you going to sit down and pay a therapist or a psychologist to come, you know, talk to them? That's not a priority actually to most people. Then you find that, you see those issues, and at times then again, people, most of the time when people are coming to you, they're already at the point of, there's a lot that will have been done if this was realized early. And then again, we have a culture of, the other day I saw somebody opening me on Facebook telling somebody, you need to be prayed for. They're now trying to discuss, these are mental health issues or these are behavior issues that totally have nothing to do with prayers. At times I wonder, God, okay. <laughs> People put a lot on him, and we, you know, because those are mainly the challenges. And again, language has also been a barrier because I feel like I'd like to reach to more people in, let's say, Trukana, Western, something. But how do you get to communicate that? Because I think one was in 2017, there's a community called, there are guys who in the Netherlands and they have a community called My Family. They do a project somewhere in, I don't know, Trukana or somewhere. And they were saying, they asked, this was actually one of my main challenges. They asked me, how do you feel the Maasai community feels when there is drought and all the cows pass away? Are they stressed? But how do you get to communicate that to such people? When there is drought or something, do those kids, I think for us, we, we've gotten into a comfort zone whereby we think it's normal for those people to be hungry or yeah. to be... And we don't think, what's the process? What's the trauma that goes with that? How do you get to communicate? Uh, how many psychologists do we have up there? Mm. Like, how do you get to communicate with them? I think that's another issue, language, yeah. Language barrier. Yeah, because yeah. then you find most of our African languages, we don't have mental health. I don't know where you come from, which part of Kenya, but you were told to say depression in that language. I'm sure you'll be like, I have no idea. I think that should be a question for the week or something. <laughs> yeah. So you find that has most, mostly it's been an issue. The most people who really need this, because the people who are suffering the most, they will learn us in social media that you can be able to Google to or do write, something. Yeah. What about those people who don't understand this? I as much as you would want to go there and do this, I'm so sure I wouldn't speak that language. And they even don't know they're depressed in the first place. Yeah, and then you see the mistake we do most of the time as a society, we forget that those people, I'm a parent actually, so we forget that those people, they're going to come back into the city or anywhere, they're going to meet with my kid. And those kids that are traumatized, they're going to relate with my child. What's the byproduct? They're going to date with my daughter. What happens next? Because again, we can't be educating one part of Kenya or the society and living the other part around, because these people are still going to meet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's the role of the society or, or Kenya itself in fighting uh, mental health? And then that's why it goes back to digital, it's a personal thing. Okay. Then when you move to yourself, then how do you educate your sister, your brother? It's a more of a social th mm. thing. Like if you know about these things or you've heard about this thing, why not move next to your family member or your girlfriends, your boyfriends, your men, your circle, then tap it up. I think everybody has somebody who lives in Ocha or somewhere where would say in up country. How about stepping into those people? Okay. Then I think as a country, we can be able to do so much. Because mm. I'm so sure by the time, yes, they're professionals in those areas, but how much can they do? Mm. Then you, 
again you find that we are a country of mental health issues but every year we have psychologists graduating how do you, how are we able to maybe put those people to the society or community levels yeah so uh, talking about corona and the difficult times, uh, maybe you can tell us how you're keeping afloat during these hard times. Okay, I'd say I am also into business okay. and I have an amazing business partner or a partner who is totally amazing. So for myself, or maybe being able to help I can, that's, um, yeah, I'm blessed enough. So that one, that's good enough. Mm -hmm. But then again, not everybody has the luxury of that or not everybody is comfortable to doing that. As I say, most of the time we find mental health is not a priority. It's not food, it's not shelter, it's not clothing. So for me, I'd say I'm okay, but I've seen other people who, who are, are not okay. Yeah, it's a bit hard for them to move to that part. And at times, you know, even me as a professional, I know when I tell you, go mentor this poor, go talk to the people, you need transport. By the end of the day, if you're a parent, you need to go back to the house. Your kids need to eat. Then after that, how do you pay your rent? So it becomes a bit difficult for people to to be able to do some of these things or to help the society unless they're doing it straight at their doorstep. Then also again you find that professionals are also humans. It's hard for me to come tell you not to get stressed when I'm worried about food or shelter. Okay. It becomes a bit. So what advice would you give to Kenyans or people who are watching right now and what advice would you give them? How, how should they deal during these hard times? Because I'm hoping this time will end up very soon. I'm yes, hoping soon yes. it's going to be over. But for now, I think it's a day at a time, a step at a time. Nobody is okay. I believe most people, included me, we didn't meet our goals for last year. And this year, we just here stated, like, figure yourself out. <laughs> then after that, I think the basic thing, you woke up your life, that's good enough. Living is basically good enough. Then how do you get to build up on that? Don't pressure yourself. Don't trust yourself. I think it's a global thing. If you ask even the president himself, I'm so sure he didn't meet whatever he wanted for Kenya last year. So I think everybody is struggling in their own way so don't pressure yourself don't stress yourself a day at a time mm. if you can be in a position to help help in, and don't think it ever goes to waste if you're giving somebody a helping hand and for you it's more you never know the ripple effect you never know what you're doing for somebody else yeah mm. so what's your vision like where do you want to see yourself in the next few years feels worldwide oh for now i'm living on the mantra of africa it's Africa and beyond. So right now we're hoping possibly by the end of the month we'll hit 15 countries. And just more it's more of getting to communities. How do you get to establish a the community as well? Because African issues are not the same. They're not like different. These are the same issues. We suffer the same way. Whatever is happening in Kenya is the same thing that's happening in Tanzania, Uganda, so Nigeria. When you talk about awareness and people can't understand what's mental health, you know, that's the same thing those people are, are are struggling with how about and my vision is how about my experiences in Kenya can I get to share them elsewhere can somebody get to share the experiences in Nigeria or somewhere else can I see what can I pick from them take it back here in Kenya and maybe to luck mm -hmm. can they pick whatever I'm doing here and you know take it out there yeah. so so far how many countries have you been able to reach mm, right now three so far we're okay. working with three countries so far Kenya. that is Nigeria uh -huh. Ghana and Burundi mm -hmm. and we're hoping India soon and how would you uh, compare the, the way they receive, okay, they I receive think for the me, program? I must actually, it's something I've had to learn. I think we not, I've not been exposed in terms of language. So first of all, for me, language was a wake up because they have pigeon in English and I'm like, okay, wait, now I have to listen all this to this. But for them again, okay, in West Africa, it's a bit tricky because, you know, they believe in the witchcraft. It is, the culture is more deep than it is. No, having to you know and do that and what they learn and for those who are open-minded and what what do they practice i'd say we are almost at the same level it's more about for us when it comes to mental health mental health is very fresh in africa we're doing the basics we're learning because i'm so sure when was the first time you had the term suicide mm, i think i hear it almost every day no the, no i mean the first time you had it the first time yeah. i had suicide mm. Uh, was it in high school after high school or after high, after school, high school definitely so you can only imagine we're teaching you these things after high school okay so what do we have to now we're still young so we are at the basic step we're not even at we are at the preventive stage and educational stage we're n then again we have to do like we're trying to do damage control educate and help people at the same time because one you find that I, I wish 
small kids in primary, and that's what we're doing. I wish somebody taught me about self-esteem when I was young. Somebody taught you about how to be, you know, life coaching, how to set up your goals when you were five years old, and how to do the vision board. And, you know, it's kind of funny. These kids outside there, they learn these things when they're six, seven, or something. These are the things we're teaching in companies here at 14. Oh, yes. <laughs> at 14. <laughs> And I was just like, okay, we have a long way to go, but you know, can we still keep going? Mm. And then that's one of the things. In in Africa, we're still at the basic stage. Let's learn this. Because if you go and ask somebody outside, as I said, we don't even have languages for mental health. If you go ask somebody else, we're outside here. Yeah. What is mental health? What do you think about mental health? What's depression? What's anxiety? What's bipolar? You know, what's society? Such things. What's trauma? Some people are just going to love it and be like, I've, that thing sounds for me. You know, it sounds for me. So I think we're just at the basic stage. Educate yourself. We mm -hmm. have to do like a whole introduction program whereby trauma is, stress management is, and that's what we do. Okay, so maybe as we end the show, maybe okay. you can give us a parting shot. Oh, you give your viewers a parting shot. Okay, I'll still say taking care of yourself is key because nobody will come. It's not a blame game thing. I know that society is interlinked, but how do you put your boundaries around? How do you ensure that nobody is to blame to whatever you're going through? Take care of yourself. That's a basic thing. If you have any issues, speak out. It's nobody's going to judge you if you feel we are on social media Jintunze in Twitter Jintunze underscore KE Facebook Jintunze underscore KE Twitter yeah I've said Twitter Instagram Jintunze underscore KE yeah we have everywhere reach out and the people who are willing to volunteer as well at that time we have volunteers even in Nairobi okay yeah so thank you so much for You're joining welcome. us it was a pleasure having this discussion about you and I've learned I've learned a few things and I'm sure people also have learned I I such a you're welcome oh, yeah. okay. so that was Grace Kimmy a psychologist, life coach, and a mental health advocate who has told us that we should take care of ourselves. And it's true, we should take care of ourselves, we should take care of our mental health, our health, our physical health, and make sure that you're fit before you go and, you know, fight issues out there. Yeah. So right about now, we're going to go for a short break, but Usiende Pahali will be back with more. Don't forget to follow us on all our social media platforms at Y254 channel.